Robert Knowles of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you all to our third Hong Kong Maritime Forum, which is taking place within the context of the Hong Kong Maritime Week. Unfortunately, given the travel restrictions, we could not be uh, in Hong Kong in person, but since we could not bring our international delegates and speakers to Hong Kong, we chose the other way around. We are bringing Hong Kong to them through this digital forum. We have made a commitment to Hong Kong as Capital Inc. and we have been privileged and honored to have participated in the previous Hong Kong Maritime Weeks and therefore we could not be absent this time. Actually, I think that uh, the topic that we chose this time is quite unique because the whole idea is to promote and raise awareness to an international audience about Hong Kong's continued maritime leadership. I would like to thank Wing GD, a leading uh, developer of low speed gas and diesel engines used for propulsion power in, the, in merchant shipping for sponsoring today's uh, event. As I mentioned, uh, Hong Kong has a long standing leading position as a global maritime hub. Uh, hub. Uh, most of Hong Kong's uh, advantages, competitive advantages, remain in place and have actually improved over time, overcoming geopolitical and industry challenges and competition from other maritime hubs. But today, Hong Kong can also play a new role as a super connector between China and the world and facilitate and enhance access to Chinese resources while also offering and improved infrastructure and possibilities through the Greater Bay Area. We have with us a panel of experts, and I'm grateful and privileged to have them uh, on this panel, stakeholders from different aspects of the industry who can provide us with comprehensive viewpoints on the above. So our discussion will cover the new possibilities as well as the traditional advantages as these have developed today. So I will introduce the speakers in alphabetical order, Mr. King Chao, the Executive Chairman of Wakong Maritime Transport Holdings, Mr. Bjorn uh, Hogard, a Chief Executive Officer of Anglo Eastern Univan Group and Chairman of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association, Mr. Edward Liu, partner of Hill Dickinson in Hong Kong and Principal Representative of the International Chamber of Shipping China Liaison Office, Mr. James Tong, Managing Director Head of Global Shipping and Logistics for the Asia, Pacific, and Japan region for Citibank, Corporate and Investment Banking. And of course, uh, Mr. Benjamin Wong, Head of Transport and Industrial in West Hong Kong, the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Uh, I would like to thank them again for being with us. And one of the great things that we have gained uh, by being in Hong Kong is uh, friendships, uh, that we have developed uh, with all of you over the years. So thank you for joining us. And um, so Hing, Edward, James, Bjorn, and Benjamin, welcome. Let me start on the first topic, the Hong, uh, Hong Kong as a super connector between China and the world. And I will address the first question to Hing. Now Hing, during the global pandemic, travel between China, Hong Kong, and many parts of Asia and the West has more or less come to a stop, which has made it more difficult for the West to keep abreast of developments in China. However, Hong Kong has been closer to the West on one hand, and people in Hong Kong also are physically in China. So you can travel to the different cities, you can have dialogue with people and companies not on the ground. So can I say that in fundamental ways, Hong Kong has become more important so if the rest of the world wants to find out what China is doing or thinking, Hong Kong is the gateway. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good evening to you. First of all, I think Hong Kong has always been a very important information and communication center between China and the world. That part in our role hasn't changed. However, what happened due to COVID is that a lot of the normal flow of people, uh, such as face-to-face -face meeting, travel to into Hong Kong and into China from the rest of the world has been well knew impossible. And this, at the same time, um, we have made significant progress in Hong Kong in terms of development of the Greater Bay Area. 
um, in terms of how we are going to extend Hong Kong's core competitive strength into China and to bring Chinese strengths to the world via Hong Kong. So I think the role of Hong Kong as a platform as, and as a vital center to disseminate information about China in general, but indeed more importantly for our audience here, what's happening in the maritime world in China. It's very important. Um, for us based in Hong Kong, even though there's a cost to travel, we can at least travel to China. And over the last few months, the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association has uh, led a delegation uh, into China, and we've made significant progress in terms of our discussion, both with stakeholders within the GBA, uh, as well as in Shanghai and elsewhere in China. So I think, you know, Hong Kong is now starting to play uh, even more of a critical role in driving conversation of how China and the rest of the world can cooperate. Very interesting. And it's not, it's not just the information flow, as we mentioned, it is also the understanding. Yes, so absolutely. Clear you have an understanding both of the West and also of China. And I think being in the middle uh, can really serve as a link, if I may use the word. The word. So that is, uh, that is great. Now, turning to Benjamin. Benjamin, the World Maritime Merchants Forum took place recently in Hong Kong and engaged several high level, high profile officials and executives from mainland China and, and Hong Kong. So this obviously is the result of the history cultural sensitivity, deep economic links, and personal relationships of Hong Kong with mainland China and with the rest of Asia, and demonstrates Hong Kong's unique ability to serve as a conduit for information, as King put it, and also for dialogue with China, an advantage that I think no other maritime hub can claim. So can you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. Um, thanks, Nicholas. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, now, um, for the question, actually, there are uh, a few keywords, actually, I think um, they are uh, kind of like the core of what we are. Uh, connector, understanding, dialogue. Um, now, all these, actually, it is something that uh, we've been doing. Uh, but of course, uh, with the pandemic, uh, as Hing mentioned, um, then with, uh, with the traveling restrictions, then it is kind of like um, disabling part of our work. But then actually, you know, with technology, we've been doing a lot on the, on the online platform, uh, webinar and all that. Uh, last year, we've done a, a lot of events with uh, Capital Link, Nicholas and Annie. Um, and uh, so with this, actually, we keep ourselves uh, continuing on that. And of course, um, Invest Hong Kong, we have um, 30 offices around the world. So uh, we are also able to, um, to extend our reach to different parts of the world. We cannot travel over there, but then we've got colleagues over there, uh, including also uh, two offices in the, um, the States um, and then also five offices inside of mainland China. Now, I think um, the word dialogue actually, it means multiple way of communication. So this is something that uh, we try to do as much as possible. Uh, when we are talking about multiple way, actually it is more than just say uh, between uh, different countries, uh, but rather uh, it is including both internationally and also domestically. Um, now, uh, I believe uh, you know that um, uh, uh, China is pushing forward with the uh, dual circulation. This is exactly that what we need to do. Uh, whereas, you know, globally, the GDP is about 85 uh, trillion US dollars. Uh, China itself, um, the GDP is about um, uh, 14, 15 trillion US dollars. So it is a good 18% of the global uh, trade. So this is something that we cannot forget about. So for Hong Kong, while we are extending our reach overseas, at the same time, we are also trying to extend into mainland China. This is something not that, that we are not uh, saying that only Hong Kong can do, right? Hong Kong is a very international conduit. So this is something that we are creating a platform for uh, overseas office to participate and at the same time, uh, 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 Chinese companies to participate in the uh, global stage. Um, so for this, actually, I think um, the GBA, of course, is something that uh, it, is, it is a starting point. Uh, but then at the same time, um, uh, this is uh, something that we believe uh, there will be a lot uh, for Hong Kong to continue doing. Uh, we have a report just out last month, uh, which is the report on Hong Kong's business environment, uh, which if any audience, um, they're interested, uh, please let me know. Uh, we can send you the link. Uh, and then, of course, um, connection, interaction, uh, next, um, we'll be having our Hong Kong Maritime Week. Um, we canceled that last year, but this year we are back. Uh, so we will be uh, uh, having about 30 events uh, in that week. So please uh, join us online or if you are in, here in Hong Kong, uh, join us physically. 
Of course, as I mentioned, uh, I'm delighted to see that a number of events are taking place during the week uh, in physical form or hybrid form. Regrettably, international travelers could not uh, come in, but here we are and we're bringing Hong Kong to the world. Right, uh, yes. So uh, I will now go to the second topic. And the, the second topic is to facilitate Hong Kong, to facilitate and enhance access into Chinese resources. And I will start with Bjorn. Bjorn, as the CEO of a leading global ship management firm and chairman of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association, can you please share with us the advantages you enjoy operating out of Hong Kong? Also, how does this facilitate your access to Chinese resources? And one of them, for example, can be crewing or shipyards or, or other. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, traditionally, Hong Kong's strength uh, for international business has been a low and stable tax regime, a uh, Hong Kong dollar that is freely convertible and pegged to the US dollar, uh, and the rule of law, you know, knowing that uh, you can trust the judiciary system in Hong Kong in case you have uh, a dispute. Um, now, with, with the GPA vision, um, the role of Hong Kong is going to strengthen in as much as the 11 municipalities around the Pearl River Delta, 80 million people, $2 trillion worth of GDP, is going to be even more connected than it already is. It's, it's, a, it's a way of uh, reducing the friction um, between goods, services, and people within this region, making sure that, uh, that the Greater Bay Area is super connected. And obviously, Hong Kong's access to China through that further integration is only going to enhance. Um, Hong Kong uh, is on, on, on the coast of China and has easy access to get to the shipyards, um, to the Chinese uh, crewing sources and to the Chinese ship owners. Uh, so in that sense, there's a lot to speak for the further integration. Now, obviously the last uh, 20 months or so have been difficult with uh, severe border restrictions and, and, uh, and difficulties in travel um, due to COVID. And one of the other strengths of Hong Kong has been the ability to reach 30, 40% of the world's population within five hours of, of flights, uh, which is really significant. But of course, that we are still waiting for uh, a resolution to the, to the very strict border controls. Bjorn, if I can just uh, stay with, with you for a moment, is uh, I, I know that uh, I, I've, I've seen that uh, Chinese crews are playing a never increasing role in international shipping. And I presume uh, working out of Hong Kong gives you also more immediate access to that pool. Am I right? Yes, it's obviously easier working out of Hong Kong uh, to reach into manning agencies and crew pools in China to address training needs and uh, also in terms of the cultural understanding and language uh, barriers, it's easy to have um, that connection with the crew sourcing in, in China. Now, Chinese crewing has always been important and, and remains important, but it's not like you can overnight or over a couple of years dramatically change the numbers. I mean, the mix of Chinese or Indian or Filipino, East European, etc is what it is because it takes a long time to build a captain or a chief engineer, right? So you can't change that overnight, but, uh, but, but Chinese crewing is and, and, and uh, will continue to be very important for international shipping. So now if I, if I go on to James, uh, an international banker. James, Hong Kong has traditionally clear advantages as a, a, as a financial hub. And shipping is a capital intensive industry and therefore debt financing coming from traditional sources has in aggregate diminished over time, whereas financing from Chinese leasing firms have been constantly growing. Also, we have seen that a number of Western banks uh, have opted to finance shipping indirectly by working with the Chinese leasing firms rather than working directly with the shipping company. So working out of Hong Kong, is it, does it provide you easier access to uh, Chinese financing? I think we should look at beyond the Chinese leasing firm. In fact, this is the financial hub. Hong Kong has all sorts of financing instruments available to ship owners. 
it just so happened Asian players tends to use debt more often provided by commercial banks. What we see is um, look at a lot of Chinese company are relisting in Hong Kong. Obviously, this is where it's a capital center that they could raise a lot of capital in Hong Kong, whatever industry you are in. I think having the Chinese leasing company establish their presence in Hong Kong definitely help um, because it gives another avenue for ship owners to tap into uh, uh, financing. And for a number of European banks or other banks are looking into financing, leasing firm, and then to the ship owners, um, the two way, because these financial leasing firm normally will have a much bigger balance sheet than a shipping company. And a shipping portfolio might only account for a certain percentage of the total loan book or leasing book. In that sense, from the diversification perspective, uh, it's much better than lending it directly to the ship owners. Maybe there is concentration risk or single borrowing limit, all sort of reason. But what I'm trying to say is, is always um, Hong Kong is always the place that to raise capital, whether it's long, capital intensive or not. I think it is important to also see that the industry is going through quite a, a lot of change, like the uh, COP26 is happening right now, right? And talking about green shipping as well. I think, I think this is where financial hub would have in, enough intelligence um, professional to create even more products for this industry to work together to a greener place. So this is how I see, um, I mean, some people come, some, some people go, you know, but some people will always come in Hong Kong to invest. So it would never be changed. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, turning over to Edward, Edward, Besides being a senior partner at Hill Dickinson, you are also the principal representative of, for the International Chamber of Shipping at China Liaison Office. So why did ICS prefer to establish its first Asian office in Hong Kong and through it gain exposure to the whole Chinese market? What was the rationale and expectation behind it? Uh, thank you, Nicholas. It's a very good question, actually. And, uh... I think as what you said at the very beginning of the introduction session, that you mentioned about the role being played by Hong Kong as a super connector between mainland China and the rest of the world. And indeed, that's the reason why ICS chose the first overseas office in Hong Kong as the home of the China Lian's office is because that we want to take the, to, to leverage the advantage of Hong Kong as the super connector. And we want to definitely make the connection between with the Chinese shipping community and then linking them to the, 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 the rest of the world, i.e. the members of the ICS. So that on one side, that the ICS uh, views and positions can be shared with the Chinese shipping community so that they can understand what is happening, what is, uh, what is the, the, the trend of the shipping, global shipping in China. And on the other hand, that and it's also always my intention as well that to bring more Chinese voices or Chinese wisdom to the global shipping governance. So um, in the past two, two uh, time is flying actually, and, and, and two years have already passed. Despite of the, the unprecedented challenges that we never anticipated when we decided to set, set up the, the office in Hong Kong that uh, uh, we encountered almost, uh, I think it's very soon that two years a COVID uh, pandemic, but in the past two years that we achieved, achieved a lot. For example, that um, we have already, I mean, the ICS have already established a very close relationship with the various Chinese authorities, including the Ministry of Transport and also China MSA. And also, for example, starting from last week uh, uh, regarding the World Mar uh, Maritime Merchant Forum, our chairman and the general secretary and the deputy general secretary attended a number of uh, uh, the forums held in Hong Kong and mainland China, starting from that uh, for forum, then and on uh, 1st November, it is the Great Bay Area American Forum, and then uh, uh, on, on 3rd and 4th of November, that will be the North, uh, Northbound Forum held in Shanghai. So uh, ISS now has been highly recognized by the Chinese community, and uh, we are in the very good process of uh, 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 getting more attentions from Chinese authorities, uh, Chinese 
uh, shipping industries to the international uh, shipping. And, and what that we are working very also closely with the Chinese authorities and, uh, and the stakeholders regarding, for example, uh, um, the green, uh, the decarbonization, the green shipping, all everything that's relating to the shape of the future of shipping industry. So that's what we have done in the past two weeks, the past two years. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. So now turning uh, back to Heng, uh, Heng, you are the executive chairman of a major global shipping company uh, with a, a long tradition of operating out of Hong Kong. So can you share with us, I mean, you're a global player, but what are the advantages that Hong Kong provides to you as an operating base? And above all, how does it facilitate your access to Chinese resources? I know uh, that you've been very active with uh, Chinese shipyards, crewing, financing, the whole range. So I think uh, please share with us some of the insight uh, on that. Thank you for your question, Nick. Um, in a nutshell, if I can answer just in a, in a single phrase, being Hong Kong enable us to be close to where the action is taking place. This is the center where a lot of deals are being made, um, whether in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, Guangzhou. So um, James earlier referred to the fact that being Hong Kong, we have the access to all types of uh, capital, be that from mainland China or from international world. That is true. That gives us an extra option, uh, particularly during this time when travel is so difficult around the world, um, unless you already have an established relationship with a leasing company in China, for example, it's very difficult to do a new deal if you're on, not already on the book because of KYC, because cultural differences and all that. In Hong Kong, we have a critical edge um, compared to the rest of the world because of this accessibility because of the fact people from China can also, and are much more willing to travel to Hong Kong. At the same time, I think Wakong in a way is quite illustrative um, of the transforming ecosystem of the maritime world, particularly in the financial world, where you know, um, the leasing company are now playing the role, not only of financiers, but acting as de facto um, ship owners, some of them being more active even, um, going directly to charters and making deals. However, they still need um, extensive support from the likes of Anglo Eastern, from the likes of Hua Kong, whether it be it operational support, ship management, new building management, or even taking on the ship on TC. So being in Hong Kong really gives us access to a lot of the new things which are happening in shipping coming out of China. Finance one part. The other part is, of course, as Chinese players, as Chinese companies, be that uh, commodity traders, more importantly, shipping companies, as they start to play a bigger role um, in global shipping, they need international legal services. And we are in Hong Kong to play that role, to support them. So I would say in Hong Kong, all in all, we are extremely well placed, um, A, as a springboard into China, but also a platform for China to connect with the rest of the world. And going back to your earlier question to uh, Bjorn as well, Wakong, we are also quite fortunate in having set up um, uh, a satellite office in Shenzhen, which has now grown to uh, over 40 people in just over a year. And had, it, had we not got this uh, sensor in Shenzhen, we would not have been able to handle new building projects in seven shipyards at the same time, or along the Chinese coast during the height of COVID. So these are all points to illustrate the critical advantage that Hong Kong has, or being in Hong Kong really holds. So, you know, what, uh, what is really evident from our discussion here is that exactly that Hong Kong itself obviously is a major maritime hub. And I'd like to go back uh, to, to go to the point of the local infrastructure and so on. But that is a given. The new element here is the role of exactly being the super connector to China and facilitating uh, access to all these uh, resources. Um, so if I go now to the next topic, the Greater Bay Area, uh, I know Hink was uh, chairing a whole forum uh, you know, today uh, uh, before our event. So uh, 
this is a major topic. We have all uh, touched upon it, but I think it's worth discussing it in a little bit more detail. I'd like to understand the implications uh, of the Greater Bay Area for Hong Kong and by extension for the international shipping community. So Hank, let me start with you, if you don't mind. The Greater Bay Area is part of China's broader dual circulation policy, as Benjamin mentioned. Now, in this context, uh, Hong Kong will be, by the way, if you can define for us the dual circulation policy and what it means. So in this context, Hong Kong is expected to be at the very center of sign of China's policy, meaning that it will be the nodal point where ideally flow of capital, talents, information from China and the rest of the world come together. So can you share with us the details of what this entails and how it works and what are the practical ramifications for someone like yourself with a global ship owner? I can maybe sum it up in four sentences. The first sentence is Hong Kong has a lot of traditional strength as a traditional, important global maritime center. Um, our representatives here, um, James and Edward, represent these two aspects, i.e. Hong Kong is a major legal center and a major financial center, in addition to shipping. And all these two serve, um, major um, high value services work in very close collaboration for shipping. So that is one of the core strengths. And through the Greater Bay Area, we hope, A, to create a better bridge between China and the rest of the world, but also to extend these services and allow Chinese companies to, A, to tap into the global capital market and pro provide access point for collaboration and partnership with international banks, such as uh, Citibank here. And at the same time, we provide them with the legal services so that they can sail into the global shipping world, if I could put it metaphorically that way, in, uh, in the relative comfort of uh, dealing in Chinese language and working with a cultural environment that they're familiar with. So that is a traditional part of uh, Hong Kong's strength. The second part, um, I would say, is innovation and knowledge. As Hong Kong is transforming from a traditional shipping hub into one driven by knowledge and one driven by wisdom, um, how we are going to go about reforming maritime knowledge is going to be a whole the key. We have to look beyond Hong Kong and we have to look beyond China at this stage. The, the world as a whole, global shipping as a whole, as, as James said earlier in this conversation, we are at a green revolution. We're at the cusp of the biggest challenge that the industry has faced for maybe over a century. At this moment in time, it's no time to hold back. We have to be creative. More importantly, we have to embrace knowledge. We have to embrace research. And the Greater Bay Area is one of the few economic zones in the world that has a full supply chain in terms of uh, the ship shipping ecosystem, from capital to shipbuilding, ship owners, operators, cargo owners, ports, and even shipbreaking. So in this respect, um, I believe that if we put all the collective strength of the Greater Bay Area together, we should also position ourselves as a major place of innovation because whatever IP is generated out of the future maritime universities, they will go directly into the industry. They will become products for shipyards, for financial institutions, for ship managers and ship owners. And that is another major strength. The third part, Hong Kong as a platform, as we have already said, Hong Kong has always been an integral center for communication flow between China and the rest of the world. However, the information flow, and maybe my colleagues here will also agree with me, to up to now, even though they're both present, very much present in Hong Kong, they're not always connected. But through experiments, indeed very important steps, which are being taken by the maritime industry and which are being taken by the Hong Kong Ship Owner Association, such as the World Maritime Merchants Forum that was held about 10 days ago. I think that is a clear demonstration of China's will also, uh, Hong Kong's will together with China to construct a platform to engage with the rest of the world. So as I said, Hong Kong surfing as an international platform will only become more important and people are really starting to take the initiative 
and seize opportunity to put Hong Kong shipping at the higher platform of international dialogue. Um, and then the third level, at the fourth level, is how it all comes together. I think the Greater Bay Area, if we cast our eyes five years, 10 years down the road, could be where a new maritime ecosystem could emerge. So this is how I see Hong Kong. This is how I see the Greater Bay Area. So can, can I paraphrase in a way and say that, I mean, Hong Kong clearly has, has been a global maritime hub, but now this regional aspect is going to reinforce the global competitiveness of Hong Kong. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, you know, um, I'm a ship owner, and one of the sectors we invest in are Cape size. And currently, you know, one of our core committees, Iron Ore, most of it is actually due for China. So being in Hong Kong and being in China does really allow us much greater accessibility to global trade via China as China occupies a more important role. This is undeniable. So Hong Kong is not about, you know, just uh, being a regional center, but indeed, as you said, a global center of shipping. And this Hong Kong is a point, or Hong Kong, or the Greater Bay Area through Hong Kong is the point where the dual circulation, the two circles meet. And that's obviously part of the planning, so it, it is happening. Uh, Bjorn, turning the same question to you. I mean, you are a ship owner, you're a ship manager. How does uh, the Greater Bay Area facilitate or enhance your operations? Um, is it access to more resources? Yeah, that's, that's part of it. Um, I think... You know, again, if you go back to what is the vision for the Greater Bay Area, this is um, six percent of China's population, but twelve percent of China's GDP uh, around the Pearl River Delta, and the the integration of these eleven municipalities uh, around the Pearl River is a chance to have the Greater Bay Area work as a dynamo for the next level up in development in China. Um, you know, the expertise that sits in manufacturing, logistics, financial services, shipping, obviously, but also technology innovation. Uh, Shenzhen is well known as the Silicon Valley of the East. Um, and I think, as, as Hing said, you know, shipping is on the cost of some very big changes where the bigger, um, the bigger canvas that we can engage with um, in all these fields, enable shipping, enable Hong Kong shipping to, uh, to evolve some of these um, developments like decarbonization, like digital, uh, digitalization, et cetera. And obviously by sort of opening up from being a, a region or a, a, a city hub of seven and a half million people to becoming a, a region of 80 million people, the ability to grow talent out of that place obviously grows um, manifold. So I think there are many ways that the integration uh, of the Greater Bay Area plays to uh, Hong Kong's already existing strength. And Hong Kong being you know, China's shipping center and shipping driver uh, obviously has an important role to play in that, in that uh, integration. Thank you. Now, James, turning to you, I, I'm trying to understand better how the Greater Bay Area is going to benefit, uh, create benefits in terms of capital raising, financing, and so on. Hong Kong is already uh, a global financial hub. Uh, so how would the Greater Bay Area enhance uh, Hong Kong's competitiveness in terms of being a major financial hub? And what does it mean for a global organization like yourself? I think we lost you. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, okay. technology never really, I'm never good at that. <laughs> um, the Greater Bay Area, in a way, we will be closer to where the manufacturing delta is where trade finance is happening, where technology is happening. We're talking about e-commerce in there, digitization, um, connecting legal services, connecting 
connecting all the profession basically in a much bigger zone in that sense. That means that we create activities that beyond just only Hong Kong. Um, also collaboration, there are lots of Chinese companies also having presence, moving their presence in Hong Kong. Um, that already created additional traits. And knowing that, I think Bjorn was mentioning that uh, where the population is here in, in Asia, right? And then GDP is growing eccentric in Asia. I think that allows a lot of trace between China, where relocation of plants, manufacturing plants in the Southeast Asia, that create additional flow of intra-Asia trade. That I believe that has always been exponential, you know, grow, growing exponentially. That where most of shipping company in fact eyeing these these particular trades. Although you and I have seen so many European players are also deploying the ships in intra-Asia. You know, obviously this is where the robust business happening. Um, to me, that automatically would increase a lot of financing need from working capital to trade finance, ultimately to export finance. And all of these would definitely benefiting Hong Kong or vice versa. The profession in Hong Kong can be even more utilized and you can see that otherwise capital will not be flowing in Hong Kong. You know, numbers of IPOs in Hong Kong, stock exchange, um, as I earlier mentioned, a lot of um, US listed Chinese company are also relisting in Hong Kong to take, take advantage of the capital. Like you mentioned that Hong Kong dollars is packed to the US dollar, freely convertible and attract international investors. That means Asian company, Chinese company will be growing because of these economic activities. That means we'll attract even more capital to come into Hong Kong. So all in all, I think is a virtual cycle. Um, you wouldn't go to somewhere which is not happening to, 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 to create business, uh, to set up your presence there. This is where it's happening. That I, I do think that concentration uh, uh, would attract even more activities in Hong Kong. And with the government support, which is also important, you know, Hong Kong has been have been advocating of providing uh, tax benefit to the leasing company. Obviously, um, motherland government also see that to take advantage of what our experience in dealing international trade. Otherwise, we would not have such an international uh, uh, panelist in here to having ship managers in in Hong Kong to having quite a lot of ship management companies in Hong Kong. All of these are a reflection of the importance of Hong Kong uh, 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 as, as one continue to be the important international city, the gateway for trade and finance as well. This is how I see that, the one, uh, Greater Bay Area, how it would be um, benefiting Hong Kong or Hong Kong will be benefiting this whole um, uh, um, Greater Bay um, development. Thank you very much, James. Now, Edward, I'm coming to you and then I'll go to Benjamin. How does it work for the legal side? I mean, Hong Kong has a solid uh, standing as a, a legal jurisdiction hub, as an arbitration hub. So how does the uh, Greater Bay area enhance that? Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Well, uh, indeed, as you said, that Hong Kong is the uh, the, the renowned and international legal and dispute resolution service center, um, and that is supported by the Chinese authority in the uh, in the fourteenth five year plan, as well as the Great Bay Area uh, Development Out Plan, and, and that means that on one side, Hong Kong's uh, solid rule of law and the independent judiciary are fully supported and, and endorsed by the central government. Uh, that is the foundation of uh, booming uh, legal services that we are going to talk about. On the other hand, uh, returning back to the Great, Great Bay area that the Hong Kong uh, legal services can play, uh, as, we, as we know that in the Great Bay area, it combines of uh, nine cities from the Guangdong province and also one city, is, the other two cities are the two SARs 
One is Hong Kong, the other one is Macau. So actually there are three jurisdictions with three different legal systems in this area. But so that means that if uh, the Great Bay area, we can reach a harmony of these three legal systems, that's already a role model for the different, for the, the, for the rest of the world that how could this different uh, legal culture, legal system to be working together. And uh, talking, sorry, about can, pardon. Can, can this happen, you think? I mean, that, well, that's very, yeah. There will be no uh, uh, combination or consolidation, but I think that to find a way to work together, for example, like the judicial assistance uh, 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 that I'm going, uh, I'd like to say, for example, like the intermeasure arrangement uh, entered into between Hong Kong and mainland in 2019. That is, that is the, the making Hong Kong the only jurisdiction outside, outside of mainland China that for the Hong Kong arbitration to apply to the mainland court for the, for the interim measures in out of the Hong, the Hong Kong arbitration. That making Hong Kong to be the very unique jurisdiction compared with, with the other regional competitors that Hong Kong has the advantage starting from the from from before you commence the arbitration until you got your actual award that you can seek to freeze the other side's assets so as to uh, secure your claim and that is a good way you know for the hong kong as we know the hong kong is the is the only common law uh, jurisdiction of china and then that you can apply to the civil law systems courts for the interim measure uh, and on the other hand, actually, I'd like to say is that we all know that Hong Kong, as we already elaborated, is, is the shipping and financial centers. But on the other hand, that Hong, the, the Guangzhou, for example, is, is one of the, the biggest shipbuilding base in China, as well as it is the home of, for example, a major uh, uh, shipping, shipping, ship owning companies like Costco Bulk, Costco uh, Specialized car uh, Carrier. So that means a lot of a, a synergy in this area that the different stakeholders of the shipping companies can work together and then use Hong Kong law, for example, to have the deal making in Hong Kong, I need to choose Hong Kong, uh, 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 Hong Kong law as applicable law of their government uh, of their contracts, and then of then, of course, choose Hong Kong arbitration or mediation as for the venue of uh, resolving their disputes arising from those contracts. So that Hong Kong is, is definitely, you know, can, um, uh, because there are, there are, uh, the Hong Kong common law, Hong Kong, we, we, we always say that uh, Hong Kong is the only common law jurisdiction of China, but also Hong Kong is the only uh, jurisdiction of all the common law world can speaking bilingual language, the English and the Chinese. So that making again Hong Kong strengthening Hong Kong's super con super connected role between the between Chinese culture Chinese legal system to the common law system so that especially for the shipping community that everyone prefer to use English law and I always say that even you can choose English law you can still choose Hong Kong as a venue for arbitration for resolving your disputes. So again, you know, if for, for, for whatever the China related matters, that parties should bear in mind that Hong Kong is the best place to for, 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 for resolving their disputes. Yeah. Thank you. So Benjamin, James, you wanted to say something or? If I might just chime in, in fact, trade finance is common law base, you know, Guangzhou province, they have been practicing that years of that. You know, sometimes people think that Chinese might not be honoring their common law practices. They have been doing that since trade finance is there. So I think this is, this I wanted to emphasize is that. And also to add on addition, the wealth is being created and Chinese national also having wealth. And that means we require Hong Kong as a center for wealth management. So I think these are all, all interrelated um, uh, of the legal system, the, 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 the One Bell Road, and then the Greater Bay, and then being the finance center and having the Hong Kong government support of all of these initiatives. James, is it uh, to, to some extent fair to say that Hong Kong can, can not only serve as a gateway for international businessmen to reach into China, 
but also it can serve as the window through which China can reach out to the world? Well, absolutely. You know, like the World Center otherwise would not be created in Hong Kong. And a lot of Chinese uh, financial companies or banks established their branches in here so that they could also learn about good practice, about wealth, uh, wealth products, insurance products. We also have insurance company in, 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 in Hong Kong too. So all in all, it's a, it's a two-way two -way street of, of benefiting of each other. You know, particularly worth noted is the wealth of Chinese national is increasing you know, over the last 20 years. And otherwise they will not be able to travel that much. And also when the pandemic start, all the luxury goods <laughs> cannot be, you know, in, in, in overseas will be just stop. But then in China itself, luxury group is still growing the sales, right? The wealth is, we cannot really uh, 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 forget about that. Thank you. So Benjamin, coming to you now, uh, you are the head of transport and industrial of Invest Hong Kong. So can you take us through the specific initiatives that Hong Kong has implemented or is about to implement to increase its competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other hubs and also to enforce its position as the gateway to China. Now, I know Hong Kong provides a tax-free environment for shipping. It is in the process of reducing tax for ship managers. What else in the, is in the pipeline? I mean, you put a lot of emphasis in technology and in infrastructure for the port and so on. So if you can take us through. Sure. Uh, now, uh, earlier you, uh, we have the discussion on the, the greater Bay area. So I would like to zoom in a little bit um, to Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Uh, now, the story of the Twin City. Um, Shenzhen, actually, uh, one thing um, that, um, which is very interesting and also useful um, for the uh, joint development of these two cities uh, is on the population. Now, uh, within the Greater Bay Area, um, Shenzhen has the youngest population among these all 11 cities. Uh, one uh, fact which uh, for those people they've been traveling into Shenzhen would have uh, noticed that Shenzhen, or, although originally um, the native Shenzhen people, they speak uh, Guangdonghua, uh, just like us, uh, Hong Kong people. Uh, however, uh, nowadays, if you go into Shenzhen and try to communicate with uh, Guangdonghua, that would be very difficult. Um, now, uh, because uh, a lot of the population inside of Shenzhen, they're actually from the rest of China. So actually they speak uh, Mandarin. Now, um, this uh, shows you one thing is that um, for the population of uh, Shenzhen, actually, uh, you don't have to, uh, the government, uh, it doesn't have to worry about the demography because actually um, it's a strong and interesting and vibrant enough that it's attracting a lot of people into Shenzhen. 20 years ago, uh, is people going into Shenzhen uh, to do factory works. 20 years later, now uh, people are actually going into Shenzhen for all sorts of uh, much uh, treasury industry uh, technology being the strongest. So uh, this is something that I think uh, would be uh, very useful when we put it in perspective with Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually, we are now also talking about uh, a lot about the silver economy. And we are talking about it because our population is aging. So with this is, com with this is, this is uh, complementing each other in terms of that um, global, um, uh, uh, mainland and also a uh, younger population and also uh, aging population. Um, so for this actually, I think um, uh, uh, Shenzhen actually uh, would be very useful for Hong Kong on um, population. And at the same time, uh, Shenzhen has the uh, very strong ports. Hong Kong, we also have, and also within uh, Greater Bay Area, also Guangzhou. So uh, these three ports um, is three of the top 10 ports inside of Greater Bay Area. Uh, so when you talk, uh, when we're talking about say technology for the uh, ports, then actually we have a lot to share. Um, in the uh, policy address earlier uh, in October, uh, the government has mentioned about that we will be focusing on the development of smart ports. So this, on this initiative, um, there will be a lot of things that we can collaborate and share. Um, so uh, we are forming a task force on this. Um, so uh, answering to uh, Nicholas, your uh, question earlier, uh, what we have in the pipeline, this is uh, one thing that we will be doing. And then of course, uh, you also mentioned about the, um, uh, 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 the discussion on the test concession for uh, 
what we call commercial, commercial principle, including ship managers, ship brokers, um, agents. So um, this is something that uh, we have already started in terms of forming a task force uh, to work on this. Um, so hopefully we will be having good news on this soon. Um, and then, of course, uh, when I talk about the smart ports, uh, technology for sure is one of the uh, very important elements. So the government is pouring a lot of resources uh, onto this. Um, in the next um, few years, uh, we'll be putting in 130 um, billion Hong Kong dollars into this. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is uh, cutting across uh, the whole spectrum of different industries. But then, of course, um, maritime shipping for sure is one of it. Um, and of course, uh, decarbonization. So um, all in all, I think um, shipping is a uh, layered industry at the same time, uh, multiple, multidisciplinary uh, industry. So as a whole cluster, there are a lot of things that we can work um, uh, within this um, uh, uh, area. You mentioned about that uh, shipping is tax-free here in Hong Kong, uh, but then of course uh, we've got different uh, segments of it, right? So then uh, we, we've got um, the uh, tax concession for the ship uh, leasing industry, and then also for specialty insurance, including shipping, uh, uh, shipping insurance, and then um, this couple I mentioned. Um, so I think um, there are a lot that uh, uh, is developing. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Thank you, thank you very much. So we are at the uh, one hour mark and uh, we're coming closer to the, uh, to the end, but there are still, if you allow me, an, you know, an important question to ask to, to all of you. I'm an inter I mean, you have right now uh, three major uh, hubs in Asia, Singapore, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Asia, of course, is a big place. So having three uh, hubs, uh, they can all serve the industry. But I'm an international owner, and I would like to be closer to Asia, to, to China. Where should I open up? Should I uh, go to Shanghai or Hong Kong? Should I go to Hong Kong or Singapore? So if, if you don't mind, uh, I know it's a difficult question, but it's a realistic one. So maybe I can start with Hing and ask him, how do you see the role, the synergy between Hong Kong and uh, Shanghai? Actually, it's very interesting that Hong Kong has always been on the top list uh, of the global maritime hubs. I think last year, Shanghai made it for the first time to the top three. Very interesting. So how do you see the uh, complementarity synergy between the two of, the, of them? Competition is good. Um, competition forces all of us to continue to innovate and become better and become more, even more competitive. And competition ultimately creates a better environment for all the market players. Um, I think Hong Kong, Shanghai and Singapore, they are slightly different. So depending on what you're looking to achieve, you may decide to go to Hong Kong, Singapore, or Shanghai. Um, I think if you are an international shipping company, by and large, your choice is whittled down to two. Not to discount Shanghai, but by and large, Shanghai is unable to provide the tax environment that Hong Kong and Singapore can provide. So I think from that perspective, Hong Kong and Singapore is a little bit more attractive. That's not to say that Shanghai is not doing everything they can to catch up. Indeed, from our uh, recent trips to China, we have uh, realized that um, in a new district in Pudong um, called Lingang Xinpian Chu or Lingang Xinpian district, um, they are also looking to set up uh, a zero tax um, regime for offshore operations, including shipping. So this can potentially become an attraction for shipping companies and being really at the hub of the domestic shipping center of China, which is Shanghai. However, that hub is going to take time to develop. At the moment, if you go to Lingga Xinpian Chu, it's about an hour outside of the center of the city of Shanghai. And you really don't have very much going on there except for the Shanghai Maritime University, which is very nice, but you don't have the supporting facilities, which are mature and there that you have in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Um, I think if you are an international company that wants to be closer to the trading business, Singapore is probably still a better ecosystem. So insofar as Singapore government has been a bit more successful in attracting international traders to use Singapore as their operational headquarters within Asia. 
Um, however, Hong Kong, I do see we will catch up also in the coming years, particularly for those of you tuning in from the rest of the world, um, in our chief executive's recent policy address, um, it was noted that the existing government bureau structure will go through a thorough restructuring, including separate out um, the transport, transportation services from the housing services, uh, i.e. we are going to have an independent uh, or self-standing uh, transport bureau in the not too distant future. And of course, the longer term wish and longer term goal that the industry and the SOA have been pushing for, for decades indeed, is to have an independent uh, uh, policy making body in Hong Kong for shipping. So as and when that happens, we can start to see Hong Kong being able to compete at the high government policy level with Singapore. We're not there yet, but I suspect that will come in the not too distant future. That is certainly our wish. Um, in terms of, you know, if you are a comp international company that you want to really tap into China, I think Hong Kong for everything that we have said is still the obvious place. Thank you. As we know, uh, we are particularly privileged to uh, be able to host uh, similar events in Singapore and Shanghai. We're very proud of the relationships we have developed in each area. And as we mentioned, the competition is always very healthy. And at the end of the day, it helps to improve and serve the industry better. But I'm delighted to see exactly the enthusiasm with which all of you in, in every hub are pursuing exactly improvements and uh, innovations and new initiatives. Now, Bjorn, if you don't mind me coming to you, uh, you also have, I think, uh, a big office in Singapore. So how do you see the area? How do you see the, the, the world developing from that angle? Yeah, that's right, uh, Nick. We, Anglo Eastern obviously has a big office in Hong Kong, but we also have a very big office in Singapore with uh, 150 ships, many out of Singapore office, something like that. So, um, and I have spent, you know, over the last 21 years I've spent in Asia, 15 of those have been in Hong Kong and six, six of those have been in Singapore. So I know the two places very well. Um, obviously, you know, I think Hong Kong's got a lot going for it. And I've been trying to explain some of the highlights in this last hour. Um, I think right now there are two distinct differences in approach to the pandemic. One is this zero COVID uh, approach that China and Hong Kong is choosing. And then there's the sort of living with COVID approach that Singapore and, and other places are, are, um, are starting to to go for. Um, and I think uh, the elephant in the room right now is that we don't really know how long the restrictions in terms of travel uh, will continue. I think that's going to be a big determinant for anyone who's looking to set up travel or set up business and um, international shipping businesses in Asia. Um, you know, Hong Kong's role as a financial and shipping hub is contingent on us being able to travel in and out of the territory relatively uh, freely. Now, that may very well come. It may be a question of, of, of time, but uh, as of now, we don't really have any visibility to, to that. So I think right now, um, if you are looking with short-term glasses on, on the options between Singapore and Hong Kong, I think many businesses, unfortunately, would choose Singapore. Um, but as Hing said, if, if your focus is on the China angle, then I think Hong Kong and the Hong Kong development uh, and the, uh, the Greater Bay Area developments have a lot going for it. So I think um, it really depends on what you want from an international business setting up in Asia. Um, Shanghai obviously could be a place as well. Um, but I, you know, I think all the places have got their own unique strengths and um, and are opportunities for 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 businesses in this space of the world. Thank you. So. Before we conclude, uh, maybe uh, I'd like to see if James, Edward, or Benjamin have anything to add on that topic. If you don't, I mean, so. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Yes, sorry. Uh, now, uh, just one uh, final uh, comment, uh, because I think uh, this could be quite useful. 
Uh, every year we conduct a survey uh, on the company setup here in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, for the survey here um, this year, 2021, um, we have recorded a record high of the number of foreign companies over here in Hong Kong and also record number uh, of startups uh, set up here in Hong Kong. Uh, so what it means is that um, for uh, at this point of time, we've got the most number of foreign companies here in Hong Kong. Uh, now, uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, we have um, discussed about the difficulty of traveling in to Hong Kong or traveling around the world. Um, but um, even with that uh, difficulty, actually, we've got more companies coming into Hong Kong to set up. Now, this is, again, covering the whole of Hong Kong, not just for maritime industries. Uh, but then uh, I think it's a very good uh, manifestation of um, uh, how we are performing. Um, so this is just one uh, comments that uh, I think is worthwhile to share. Nicola, if you allow me just to say uh, one or two final words, I just want to end this panel on a positive note. Indeed, we have had a, an hour of very positive conversation and discussion, but for the rest of the world who haven't been able or who haven't come to Hong Kong for at least a year and for a lot of people for over two years, actually a lot has happened in Hong Kong in a very positive way in Hong Kong, particularly for shipping. Um, Edward has already mentioned that uh, ICS has not only set up shop, um, the first office outside the headquarters in the world in Hong Kong, but also they have used Hong Kong as a base to establish good connections throughout China, particularly with the Ministry of Transport. Um, but at the same time, the Hong Kong government has shown greater support for the maritime industry than it has demonstrated for many years. Um, the tax concession that we have discussed today is one illustration. Um, the fact that BIMCO has also put Hong Kong in as a suggested place for arbitration, in addition to London, New York and Singapore, last October is another illustration of the flows of confidence, not only in Hong Kong and China, but from the rest of the world. So I think, you know, um, just ending on the note of Benjamin, that we see companies also um, not only limited to the maritime industry, choosing Hong Kong as a place, particularly for startup, is really a sign of confidence that people have in Hong Kong and in China going forward. Thank you, Nick. Last two words from me, Nicholas. That, of course. Um, Asia Pacific is big enough, I think, uh, to have Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And, and as you said, and I agree that a healthy uh, competition among all of us is very good for the, uh, for the business in this area. And, and, and comparing with Shanghai and Singapore, Hong Kong has our own unique advantages that we are common law system on one side uh, and on the other side that uh, we are part of China. So the current environment, uh, while it is challenging, I think it provides also the unique opportunities for Hong Kong to uh, consolidate and capitalize on its inherent strengths and the national policies uh, to be an international uh, shipping center and uh, a legal center. So I, I believe that this is the uh, direction that Hong Kong will continue to move toward and uh, uh, and including me that I'm wearing two hats, one is the SAS, one is a huge consensus partner, that uh, both of these uh, organizations are treating Hong Kong as a very important place uh, for our business uh, and our uh, policies to be uh, further uh, uh, tailor-made with Chinese shipping uh, communities and legal communities. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for uh, a tremendously interesting uh, and dynamic discussion and very positive. Now, last year, when we uh, had our uh, second uh, Hong Kong Maritime Forum, we started it with a trip down memory lane. Uh, King was very instrumental uh, helping us to put together a wonderful uh, story uh, of Hong Kong's development. And uh, I think we need to update it uh, hopefully for our next event uh, and incorporate all these new elements and the new direction that Hong Kong is taking. And I think uh, I should say that uh, reaffirming global uh, maritime industry leadership, not only building on a traditional innovation, but also building on resilience. Because I think that has been also a, a great uh, topic of Hong Kong's resilience and endurance over the, uh, the years. So I'd like to thank you all 
very much uh, for joining uh, us today. I know that you're particularly busy with the Hong Kong Maritime Week, so I'm really grateful uh, for your uh, involvement. And I do hope that next year we can be really in person um, together in Hong Kong. Thank you to all uh, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.